major funding for Making Sense of the 60s was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Additional funding was provided by Sims Clothing Stores, where since 1960 an educated consumer has been our best customer. And by Toms of Maine, a pioneer in natural personal care. Toms of Maine and Nature, a friendship of 20 years. What the automobile did for America in the first half of the century, the university will do today. Clark Kerr, President, University of California. Dear Bob, so my kid brother's high school class is beginning to think about college. Sure. I'll be glad to help you prepare a report on Michigan State. Your first friend on the faculty will probably be your enrollment officer, the person who helps you get organized at registration time. Another friend will be your counselor, who talks over your interests and background and helps you map your college program. He's available for consultation any time during your college career, when you need advice about personal problems of any kind. I was right in my sophomore year and they threw me out of school and this is 25 26 years ago now and it's still a reference point in my life and it's still very painful and I believe this was the beginning of my personal radicalization <laughs> um, we all had a habit of hitchhiking unfortunate habit and I was the one who it caught up with this bad habit, and I was raped. And my first reaction, being the idealistic young woman that I was, was to go straight to the police. And what I did not understand was that going to the police made the event public and put the university on the spot. And they forced me to leave. But my future was being taken away from me from nothing that I had done that had any malice or harm in it, harm was done to me. Embarrassed administrators like these were free to throw Judith Karpova out because they had absolute power. They didn't want their boat rocked. Like the rest of society, their goal was to maintain the status quo. That meant white male dominance, frequently racial and religious quotas, and trouble for people like Judith Karpova. In these old films, students look relaxed and free to do as they like. What you can't see is that they were subject to a system known as in loco parentis, in place of parents, in which administrators treated them like children. That's what parents expected. I have never had any doubt about what Larry could do better work than what he's doing, as I said. I believe that when he gets to college, he'll find out that it isn't the playtime that you have in high school. And it's up to him to find that out. And I don't believe it'll take them very long to show him that they separate the boys from the men when you get into the universities. For most young people in 1960, college was a continuation of high school and the next step on the path to career and marriage. 
Any criticism of the system would have to come from someone else, like little-known songwriter Melvina Reynolds. And the Of course, as every girl, I have aspirations to someday be married and raise a family and to someday be in love with someone very, very much so that even after I'm past 30, <laughs> even after I'm past 30, there's something to live for because you have someone to give your life to, someone to do things for, to um, take away from the monotony of life because as long, as long as you're giving of yourself, you still have something to live for. Maybe a nice home in suburbia and uh, some nice kids. <laughs> in a beer and a ball game on a Saturday afternoon. At Oregon State College, something new has been added. It's a student covered from head to ankle in a black bag. At first, classmates were hostile toward what appeared to be a far-out prank. The unidentified student attends only one class dressed this way. He says his idea is a testing of student conformity. Student conformity, that described the behavior of an overwhelming majority of middle-class white college students. But there was another group that didn't conform, a group that had already begun rebelling against what society had in mind for them. They were young black students attending black colleges in the South. As the decade began, these activist black students and the mainly placid white students were scarcely aware of each other. But within four years, they would together bring about fundamental changes in American society. It began with a new mood in the country, a renewed desire for change. One key reason, the 1960 election of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Absolutely clear, no question about it, that Kennedy created the general atmosphere, created a climate. Of, of high idealism and and I think you know in in telling the story of the 60s that would be the most important thing to at the beginning the idealism was evangelical I mean there was absolutely a sense of we will make a beautiful world a much better world a more humane world a more cheerful world a, a, a world that will be much more equalitarian than the world will be, a much more compassionate world there was I mean it was marvelous I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask not. Ask not. Ask not. Ask not. Ask not what your country can do. Ask what you can do for your country. Ask what you can do for your country. This is a great country. But I think it could be a greater country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. 
not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Country, 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 country. There was a sense that anything was possible. Anything could happen. We were in the heels of a revolution. Everybody was talking about a better society. He was a generation, my generation, my friends and I, who really believed we were going to live in a time in which the conditions that we saw as troubling would disappear. We could make them disappear. Maybe you couldn't do it alone, but the whole generation together could make it happen. And that was awfully, awfully exciting. So that this dream, this dream of idealism was very, very powerful. Good evening and welcome. I'd like to start out with a real protest song called I Ain't Marching Anymore. Oh, I marched to the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the early British wars. The young land started growing, the young blood started flowing. Just as John Kennedy had touched young people with his idealistic words, Phil Oakes, Bob Dylan, and many other folk singers touched young people with their songs. And thousands of them came to coffee houses to listen to this music which seemed to reflect their personal concerns so well. We were in a nightmare of frozen emotional and social distances. We cut through those. We, as folk music people, may have been a little pretty absurd, you know, talk, uh, um, b making believe we were chain gang convicts. Um, but, uh, but we did have deep feelings and were not afraid to talk about them and to sing about them. And remember, this was in a period where, where entertainment was, you know, the Las, I mean, you know, Las Vegas, and, uh, you know, and, and the, the whole thing of, of the entertainer who gets, who is very good and wants to let you know how bright he is and how well he's doing is. We couldn't care less how good we were. We were our music. Now look at all we want, we're the same red the guy. Tell me, is it worth it all? For I stole California from the Mexican land Fought in the bloody Civil War Yes, I even killed my brothers and so many others But I ain't marching anymore In places like these, students mingled with all kinds of social outsiders Negroes, beatniks, eccentrics, radicals And they heard all kinds of unconventional ideas about family, school country and civil rights if you don't see me in the back of the bus you can't find me nowhere oh come on over to the front of the bus i'll be sitting right there i'll be sitting right there i'll be sitting right there oh come on over to the front of the bus I'll be sitting right there. Another critical event in the evolution of the 60s phenomena were the black student sit-ins starting in February of 1960. 
uh, black college students throughout the Upper South initially um, organized themselves to go to sit in at lunch counters all through the, the, the Upper South in the towns in which those college were, the colleges were located. The demonstrations were nonviolent. Uh, and tremendously effective in desegregating facilities. More importantly, they were tremendously effective in uh, suggesting what the possibilities for student activism were. And the college students, um, black college students, as in those all-black institutions, provided the spark that revitalized the movement and ultimately provided many of the models, ideologically, tactically, etc., for white student activism later in the decade. It was a fabulous time. It was a great time to be in, in college and to be black and, you know, get that sense that, hey, things are changing. We're going to change the world. And, you know, we're going to South. There were the Freedom Rides. There was so much happening and so many exciting things that built hope. And you said, hey, you know, America's finally going to become America. It was almost indescribable in terms of changing my outlook on life and somehow bringing to an awareness that I can make a difference because as I grew up all I knew was you do what you have to do to survive but then as a college student I learned to take some risks. I remember as um, I guess I was, it was my sophomore year we had the first demonstration in Talladega, Alabama, and I just pulled all of my courage together and joined that march. And about a hundred of us went downtown Talladega and marched around the courthouse, scared to death. Just knew we were going to get clubbed and hauled off to jail, and then I was going to have to explain to my mom and dad what I was doing down there. But I was out there on the cutting edge, and it really made me feel good. And if I hadn't been at a black college, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have had the courage to do that. Black students who were veterans of these actions quickly organized into the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. SNCC and other black groups attacked segregation and the deep-rooted traditions behind it with nonviolent demonstrations and protests at public facilities. The Negro is not a part of my family. As a result, I don't elect to have him sit and eat with me. As a result, I don't elect to have him belong to a club that I may belong to. This is the way it has been. It's the history of the South. It's because we've been brought up like this. We have been taught like this. And we teach our children like this. And they'll teach their children like that. I think it is a matter that has been history all down through the years and will remain history. The SNCC students wanted to change the history of racial segregation, and they thought the time had come because of their sit-in successes. They believed that willpower alone could wipe out the entire system of American apartheid. That's how optimistic, or how naive, or how determined they were. They and the other civil rights groups divided up the South so each could concentrate on one area. We claim Mississippi as our own. Uh, young, foolish, dumb, really. Uh, we, we said, we're going to go in here. We're going to break this place open. And our theory was that if we brought down Mississippi, the rest of the South would have to fall, uh, and, because this was the worst of the, of the places. And how would we bring it down? We would, we would flood the state with black and white students and so overpower it with our nonviolence and our freedom schools that uh, it, it, it would not be able to resist. And then the rest of the South would look and say, oh, look what those students did in Mississippi over here in Tennessee and Virginia, we better watch out. And we thought it would all come tumbling down. It didn't quite happen that way. But I tell you, it wasn't a bad theory. You put that date right there. If you were born here in Dallas and I broke it till you would put date of your birth. What did Eleanor Holmes Norton and her SNCC colleagues intend to do in Mississippi? To register as many black voters as they could, because they believed that with enough black voters, they could defeat the laws and the leaders that kept segregation alive. 
their effort began with organizing. We'll be more than gladly to arrange transportation for you to get down there today if you can't go on your own. Our position was we had to get people to crack through the fear and that had to be done on a one-to-one -one basis and it had to be make, we had to make sure that we were talking to people about their own self-interest because we never lied to someone and said look there's no harm in this your name's not going to be published in the newspaper and if the sheriff comes at you we will protect you we couldn't do that make it so take a dive right, right through this window here in this church i sure hope you know people around the world will respond to it so we don't die for no okay let's move let's have some volunteers up here so larry can set up this workshop we Thousands of young black people were learning the theory and practice of nonviolence. They had to be taught because nonviolence isn't the way people normally react to intimidation. They had to learn to hold their tempers, whatever the provocation. This young man really isn't protected at all. His hands ought to be over his head. He should be protected. He's doing a good thing. Notice, he went down here to protect his brother down here, his sister. This young lady under here is being protected by him. But also, he didn't really protect her as well as he could be, as well as he could have. For one, this young lady here is exposed, her head is all left open. These signs, you can drop these signs and put these on top of the beach and immediately cover your head. You have to curl up. Now, this young lady, her most important part is her head and her internal section. Her internal section is protected, but her head isn't. Because it's right here, his elbow is over it. So get up and say, I'm going to show you. Now you stay here. And lie across this way. No, across her neck. No, no. No, the way I'm standing. That's right. This is the way he should lie in order to protect her. Now she is well protected. In order to protect himself, of course, your legs. So they can't jab a stick in between your legs and hurt you. Now his head is protected. He's all right. Now, you've got to be careful all not to suffocate the person underneath. But when times are difficult, these are the methods that you have to use. And she has to curl up a little more and put your head right against his body. Now, this group is still fairly well protected, even though she's being, she feels a little weight. She's not feeling anyone hitting her with a stick. So this can be very, be very effective techniques in this whole idea of school of nonviolence. Yeah, I had been raised with guns all my life. I'd been shooting since I was 10 years old, you know. And quite frankly, by now, I've even shot at a few folk, you know. Um, but the workshops, they would do workshops every night with people who wanted to help work with the project. And I can remember them being very heavy into it, the nonviolent question. I mean, the whole history of Gandhi. It was started with Gandhi and the whole history. And then you had so many preachers running around. Everybody was a reverend in them days or wanted to be a preacher. So they were connected with Jesus, you know. So you had Jesus, you had Gandhi, you had Martin Luther King, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And still, I'm looking at all these accomplishments and saying they did this with nonviolence. This is unbelievable. So I, you know, it was like total acceptance. Let's do it if, if it works like that. Go on now. Despite their nonviolence, the civil rights workers were being attacked and they were not getting the protection they had asked for from the Kennedy administration. John Kennedy was concerned enough to speak out against the violence, but he did nothing concrete to prevent it because he was afraid to anger Southern Democrats. He was trying to play both ends against the middle. He had been elected by a very narrow margin and he wanted to be reelected in 64 and he knew he couldn't be reelected in 64 if he came to be overly identified with either party to the struggle. Now I do think genuinely he came to uh, to be moved and to learn a heck of a lot about the civil rights struggle and to be ultimately quite committed to it by the end of uh, his life. But he was uh, in no way the catalyst for what occurred in the 60s. John Kennedy didn't think the civil rights struggle was his most pressing problem. His greatest worry was communism, the Soviet Union, and the possibility of nuclear war. 
The real problem is the Soviet desire to uh, expand their power and influence. If Mr. Khrushchev would concern himself with the real interests of the people of the Soviet Union, uh, that they have a higher standard of living, to protect his own security, there's no real reason why the United States and the Soviet Union, separated by so many thousands of miles of uh, land and water, both rich countries, both with uh, very uh, energetic people, should not be able to live in peace. It's the combination of these two systems in conflict around the world in a nuclear age is what makes the 60s so, so dangerous. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest America has ever come to atomic destruction, shook up many Americans, especially young Americans, just as they had been shaken by the violent reaction to civil rights protesters. We thought, why do we have to be afraid of dying? Are we really going to die? Is there really going to be a nuclear war? And why do we have to think about this? This is too big for us. I remember the absolutely stunned hush. I remember the sense of wanting to stay indoors, of being actually afraid to walk outside, not because something was going to fall from the sky at this particular moment, but because the sense of crisis was so intense and our unpreparedness for it and our sense of, of being afflicted with it was so intense that you did not want to walk alone out under that sky. And television was bringing home other distressing realities. I think we in the Midwest had been sheltered from what was happening in the South, what was happening in the black community. In the South. <clears throat> and when television came on the, on the horizon, we weren't sheltered anymore. And we saw what human beings were doing to each other. And it was really very shocking, very hurtful. We were brought up very idealistic. Uh, I was taught that there were things that were right and wrong and that America stood for certain things. And I got to a certain age and I looked around and I said, except it's not true. That there, you know, and my first instinct was, well, this is clearly, so, you know, something's falling through the cracks here and we just have to point it out and say, you know, there are these people who are hungry or people who can't vote or people getting beaten up. And, you know, if we just make people aware of that, that it'll get solved right away. And of course, it didn't get solved right away. And therefore, we began to challenge more and more the lies. And I really think that that's the basis of, of my anger and outrage in the 60s was that I had been lied to about what America was all about. I liked what I had been told America was about. And I was simply trying to make the reality conform with the promise. Uh, and the more it became difficult to make the reality to conform to the promise, the angrier I got and my friends got. 
Thoroughly alarmed by the violent white reaction to the protesters, President Kennedy had to act. He sent a civil rights bill to Congress that, if passed, would outlaw discrimination in restaurants, hotels, swimming pools, and other public places. Every major civil rights organization, plus union and student groups from all over the country, banded together to stage a massive demonstration in Washington in support of the bill. They hoped an impressive and peaceful rally would force Congress to pass it. Hundreds of thousands of people responded to the call. What took place that day was one of the most memorable events of the 60s and a high point in the civil rights struggle. I couldn't believe that that many people were there. I just assumed I would walk right up front and just sit there and listen. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty. Boy, when he stopped, it's sort of like history stopped for a moment and looked down and said, hey, watch what's going to happen now. And you knew you were on a roll when you left Washington that day. You knew something had happened. We brought an army down here and America was going to have to change. God damn it, America was going to have to change and you knew it. And unlike all the other bull crap that I had participated in my life, where you could sit up endlessly as we did in college and do your South Amorish philosophy, and then you get out of the dorm at 6.30 in the morning and nothing changed. When you came home from Washington, it started to change. America was heading into unknown territory in which a way of life was changing and hundred-year-old social customs were breaking up. The country badly needed a captain it could follow. And for most Americans in late 1963, especially young Americans, that man was John Kennedy. His words had stirred a generation and motivated many to action. Maybe he'd been slow to fully support civil rights, but now he seemed ready to push ahead. Then, suddenly, from Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Here was a guy that our parents put into power uh, who we could dig and love and, thought, and trusted. I think the, the key word is trust. We trusted JFK and we relied upon him. And when he got assassinated, there was a terrible, awful, violent wrenching of our souls. And we said, how could you do this to him? How could you let this happen to him? And there was a slamming of a door. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. 
I will do my best. At first, nobody really knew what kind of president Lyndon Baines Johnson would be or what he hoped to accomplish. He had a reputation as a tough, old-line politician, a wheeler-dealer. But when he announced his goals, they turned out to be as idealistic as his predecessors. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. The Johnson of 63 was astonishing. There was more energy in the man. Um, there was more personal interest. And there was more sincerity about poverty and civil rights. And I f began quickly to distinguish him from the Kennedys. This man had known poverty and he had known poor people. It was not an abstraction to him. It was in his gut. President Johnson achieved what JFK could not, the passage of the Civil Rights Bill. Proud of his accomplishment, he appealed directly to his fellow Southerners to comply with the law. We must not approach the observance and enforcement of this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end division. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice. If you were a black person living in the South, especially in Mississippi, the passage of the Civil Rights Act didn't change your life much. The young people of SNCC, registering black voters, continued to confront racism. And although it didn't kill their idealism, fear and intimidation did keep black voter registration to less than 5%. As the summer of 1964 approached, SNCC leaders knew their efforts were in danger of collapsing. After an angry debate, they voted, just barely, to try a risky new strategy, importing large numbers of northern white students to work with them. They hoped this would focus the nation's attention on their efforts, and keep the racists at bay. That strategy would have momentous results for all America. Of the many northern white students who had been touched by the southern black drama, about a thousand signed up for training sessions at a small women's college in Oxford, Ohio. I remember when I arrived at the Oxford orientation session of the Freedom Summer, um, I had never, I guess I had never been around that many African Americans or black people, as people were saying then. Um, there had been, you know, a few people in my life uh, in school, like one or two people, tokens. There I was, the first day. Come, in the midst of what of a group of people who seemed to me better and brighter than all those people I had been spending time at Harvard, and they were black, it was incredible that that you know I suddenly I went from mildly thinking that black people, because of certain historical conditions, were it still somewhat inferior to whites, almost like this overnight, to thinking that black people were adva more advanced actually, or at least these black intellectuals who were, elite, you know, involved were more advanced than my people. It was a in total inversion of my former reality. The white students had been told what was waiting for them in Mississippi. They had been trained to deal with it. They'd seen examples of it on television. Still, they were shocked at the hatred they found. It's like, as soon as you step over that line, there is no middle ground, and you're one of them, but if you're not one of them, then you're a nigger lover and suddenly you're the object of hate and when you feel that full force for the first time it, it um, is you're never the same again ever and that's and starting to understand a thin line between hearkening once back again back to the what is acceptable and what is not acceptable 
in certain milieus and within the society at large. And if you step over what is acceptable, then you're expendable. And in, in some cases, um, uh, in uh, 1964, any place in the South, you're literally expendable. The people should expect to get beaten. They should expect to spend in jail, and it may go beyond the summer when they're in jail, and that they should expect possibly somebody to get killed. Three civil rights workers from another group, the Congress of Racial Equality, vanished even before most of the Freedom Summer volunteers had left Ohio. Andrew Goodman, Mickey Schwerner, and James Cheney. The discovery of their mutilated bodies shocked the nation. For the first time, white children had also died fighting Southern racism. No other single event brought home to whites, students and parents alike, the seriousness of the civil rights struggle. This tragedy had the unexpected effect of protecting SNCC's Freedom Summer volunteers since it brought in the national news media. With TV cameras focused on them, most racists backed away from overt violence, and SNCC students managed to register more black voters than ever. Our confidence is a mile high. I mean, because we, we've gone four years now. We've gone into some of the worst situations and come out of them living. We've made them back up off of us in the worst kinds of situations. We don't believe nothing can happen to us. And even when those kids from CORE died in Neshoba County, we kept that vision and it was able to explain to people because the volunteers were still intact. We hadn't put them in the street yet. And we said, this is because they did not obey the instructions. Because they did not. Never do you ride the road at night in an integrated car. That was the instructions and orientation. And if you do, you never stop for anybody, ever. Even if he's the police, he follow you home where other people can witness you. And by now, we had, in, we had put uh, two-way radios in the cars. They hadn't got that installed. But nevertheless, by now, we don't believe it's possible for them to stop us. The black people of Mississippi and the students who had helped them register were confident enough now to make a bid for national power. They formed their own party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP, and they elected their own integrated slate of delegates to go to the 1964 Democratic Convention set for August in Atlantic City. Their intention was to take the seats of the all-white Mississippi delegation. As the Democratic Party delegates gather in Atlantic City, all the hoopla that is a byproduct of a party convention begins to build. What will the Democrats do without this fellow on hand? The young activists of the Freedom Democratic Party stormed into Atlantic City, filled with the fervor of Freedom Summer, convinced their energy and commitment would carry them to victory. But they ran headlong into party regulars who expected to nominate Lyndon Johnson without a civil rights floor fight, sure to anger white Southern delegates. We were confronted by a guy named Lyndon Johnson, who opened the FBI on us, who had all of us tapped, who looked at all of our personal lives in a file and who then told Hubert Humphrey and uh, Mondale that if you want to be vice president you got to stop those niggas because we would had commitments from delegates throughout the country that we will support the seating of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party because they are the true Democrats well one lady from California was told if you don't change your vote your husband won't be a federal judge so we found that when you really put the political system to test, it, could, it failed. The defeat in Atlantic City was a bitter end to Freedom Summer for many black activists. But for white students, Freedom Summer was just the beginning.
When the white volunteers returned in that fall of 1964, they were no longer innocent idealists. They were political activists, determined to use what they had learned to fight racism wherever they found it. But the colleges they returned to were the same as they had been in 1960. Administrators were still practicing in loco parentis. They still felt they had the right to control students' lives. But that right was about to be challenged. So these veterans came back and uh, what they wanted to do was have their SNCC table and we were sending money and support groups. Money, money, money and, uh, and recruiting to go south. Recruiting uh, the tables were to recruit, set up uh, where everybody set up their tables, were to recruit money and to recruit bodies and to convince people. And it was really like, uh, you know, in the older times, I guess, supporting missionary work the, of your church. If you, you know, this was your church and there were missionaries who, were the, who went out to save people. I, but, but it had that fervor. As soon as student activity started growing, the university started trying to push the activity off campus. We couldn't use the rooms. We couldn't talk in the middle of the campus. We couldn't do anything. We got shoved to the very edge of campus to this little row of dinky card tables where people came out and set up with their earnest cans and their smudgy mimeographed leaflets, you know, and say, listen, there's a little demonstration in the city, you know, you know, here's where the carpool leaves, you know, would you like to join our club and please give us 25 cents so we can print up some more stuff. And the university said, you can't do even this. And we went nuts because they were stomping on the only thing that was of meaning to us. This was next to God. This was holy. This was the holy war in America. And if you stop it here, if you say we have no right to do that, then you're bankrupt. This is really bad because this takes, this, this is priority number one. This is the main moral battlefield. We are lectured at two hours a day, uh, two, uh, two hours a week in a particular course. Former Freedom Summer volunteers may have been among the first to start questioning university policies, but their spirit was contagious and their numbers grew quickly. How you're meant to teach, what you're meant to do, how you even hold the chalk. You can't have any kind of uh, personal dialogue with the teacher if you're in a class with 400 people. It's impossible. And it is here where the rules destroy what should be the aim of the university. They actually give the United States Constitution to kids to read in school. It's just unbelievable. These kids are going to take this stuff seriously. You know? It's not just that they tell us what hour we can get back into the dorms like we're little children. It's they don't teach us about the things we want to learn about. We want to know why the society runs the way it does. Okay? We want someone to come in and teach us about the foundations of racism in society. But there's no courses about racism. Hey, we'd like a course on racism. There's no way you can get a course on racism. Okay? It's not just that there aren't any black teachers to teach it, right? It's just if there's no place in the social sciences curriculum for something like this, and there's no mechanism for the people who are doing the learning to ask, give me what I want to learn about. We'll do something which hasn't occurred at this university in a good long time. We're going to have real classes up there. But there are going to be freedom schools conducted up there. We're going to have classes on First and Fourteenth Amendments. Something extraordinary was happening at the Berkeley campus of the University of California. Formerly docile students were defying the rules and regulations, and they didn't seem to care about the consequences. The fourth, third, and second floors are filled. Stay downstairs. If you were a college administrator, this was absolutely incomprehensible. I am Dr. Edward Strong, Chancellor of the Berkeley campus. I have an announcement. This assemblage has developed to such a point that the purpose and work of the university have been materially impaired. It
it could disrupt them plenty and make life uncomfortable for them. And, and the, the, you, it was the beginning of seeing and feeling that you could matter in, in concert with other people. And that, oh my God, you know, it was very heady stuff. Mr. Keystone, would you care to leave the building at this time without being arrested? No, thank you. You are under arrest, sir. Would you care to submit voluntarily to arrest and walk out of here with a sure. policeman? Well, I'm a little tired, that's all. And I you, I time. assume you want us to carry you out of it, right? Well, yeah, I'm tired. All right, you are the 117th person to be arrested here this morning. These were no longer just the students who had gone to Mississippi during Freedom Summer. They were students who had been inspired by the words of John Kennedy. They were students who had listened to Phil Oakes and Bob Dylan and heard echoes of their own hopes and concerns. They were students who had admired the young blacks that sat down at Southern luncheonette counters. They were students who lived through and had been shaken by the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were thousands of students who unexpectedly realized that their innermost feelings were inseparably connected to the way they lived their lives, and that some things were worth fighting for. And suddenly, at that instant, historically, the traditional spectrum of politics, which had been all exterior, it suddenly was healed and made whole, and we started to understand, oh, the interior matters too. It matters to connect our feelings to our ideas, it matters to treat each other right when we're doing politics. Because if we're not kind to each other, if we, if we aren't making in what we're doing the thing that we want to build, then anything we could build is gone. This was the trouble of the Stalinist left. They treated each other terribly. They treated each other terribly for the sake of an idea, and we're not going to do that. Okay? This, you know, all the interior, all the feelings started to open up. Oh, you mean being a woman and being a man, this is political, how I feel as a woman and a man? You mean my sexual impulses, this is political material? You, 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 you mean the way I take my leisure and what I do with my entertainment time and, and whether I have to look forward to a life that's going to make me commute two hours every day on the choking freeway uh, and never get home to see my children uh, as a father? You mean this is political material? You mean the spiritual impulses I have? These, these inklings, you know, I smoked the marijuana and I lay on the grass and suddenly I realized the grass is alive, the grass has a spirit. You mean this is political? This is political? What a mind blower! What a mind blower! The defiant protests at Berkeley were only the start of a youth rebellion that was soon to sweep through high schools and colleges throughout America, and in fact, throughout the world. The rebels had begun by questioning society's right to keep black people down. But now they began to question any institution, any authority, any rule that prevented people from controlling their own lives. If these rebels had a single unifying message, it was this. The world needs changing, and we are ready and willing to take on the job.
Major funding for Making Sense of the 60s was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Additional funding was provided by Sims Clothing Stores, where since 1960 an educated consumer has been our best customer. And by Toms of Maine, a pioneer in natural personal care. Toms of Maine and Nature, a friendship of 20 years. Video cassettes of this program can be purchased for educational use only by calling 1-800-328-PBS1. Home video sales are not available through this offer. This is PBS. For a printed transcript of this program, send $5 to 60's Transcript, Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007. To order by credit card, call 212-227-READ. There's nothing wrong with just sex for sex. The 60s. Were they just sex, drugs, and rock and roll? I took a hit of Osley White Lightning Acid, and I became an instant hippie. A lot of people did not understand long hair at all. They really, it was really a threat to them. From the summer of love to Woodstock, the largest youth rebellion in our history would shake the foundations of middle class morality. There's no doubt that people were having an awful lot more sex. But as for the real fact of how we lived was food stamps. Every day in our work, they walk the streets and they steal all food. Oh, that's not true! Now I want you to make money and go to school, have a nice job. I don't have a nice job. Who's going to work? Who's going to grow the food? You don't have to go. You're going to go to the Christian process. Where do you end up? Because I have a son that's going to go into the army. Don't miss the next episode of Making Sense of the 60s.